Today we're going to look at some basic cache memory. Uh, the simple technique we're going to use is called a direct mapped cache. There are others, but this is the simplest. This is an overall diagram of a typical cache memory situation in a modern computer. Uh, once upon a time there was no cache, then there was cache on the motherboard, then there was cache on the, C on the CPU chip itself, and then there were multiple CPUs, and we went from um, very simple caching, uh, single level caching, now we're up to, in many cases, a three level cache. The, uh, first of all, we have level one cache. Uh, this is at the, and this assumes, by the way, that you have a, um, a CPU that's got multiple cores listed here as CPU, CPU 1, 2, 3, and uh, probably more, C two CPUs, four CPUs, eight CPUs, there's quite a few of them now. Anyway, um, at the, at the uh, closest to the CPU, the fastest cache is level 1 cache. Level 1 caches are normally quite small, and they're divided into a data cache and an instruction cache. The instruction cache keeps recently used instructions, and the data cache keeps recently used data. These are per CPU. So if you have a four-core system, you're probably going to have four separate instruction and dspace level one caches. Uh, the dspace and the or the dcache and the icache don't necessarily have to be the same size. Uh, very often, the data cache is larger. That'll depend upon the manufacturer. The caches, uh, the level one caches range in size from around 8K up to 128K. Uh, they're not large. They could be larger and they probably will be in the future. They're not large because they're, they're very close to the processing elements of the actual uh, CPU. And there just isn't a lot, of, uh, a lot of space there. The next level is level two cache. Now, level two caches, very often they're about two megabytes. They can be bigger, they can be smaller, there's trade-offs. These are often, again, per CPU. They don't have to be, they can be shared. It depends upon the architecture. Uh, these are larger, they're further away on the, on the CPU chip itself, so there's more, uh, they're, they're larger because there's more space available. Uh, and um, they function uh, with the, at a per CPU level. They contain both instructions and data. They're not uh, separated as the level one caches are. And finally, there's in most machines now, or many machines, a uh, level three cache. Level three cache is shared by all the CPUs. And one of the advantages of the, well, first of all, level three cache can be quite large. Um, uh, very often it isn't. It's usually about uh, the, the size of the sum of the level two caches. An advantage of a, of a shared level three cache is that, say, CPU one wants a particular piece of data. Uh, it can look in its level two cache and find if it's there or not. Let's say it's not. Uh, instead of contacting the other level two caches to find out if they've got it, it can check with the level three cache. And the level three cache can indicate that, yes, the piece of data is resident uh, and whether or not it's in use. It can be marked as being in use by one of the other caches, and it saves some some uh, some architectural uh, complexity. Uh, you see down here the Haswell. This is an over a diagram of the Haswell Intel chip, and you can see it's got multiple cores, four of them. And in here would be the level two and the level one caches. But there is the shared level three cache. You can also see a processor, a graphics processor area, and some other control areas. But um, there's a lot of these out there diagrams, and uh, they're kind of interesting. All right, here's the basic direct mapped memory cache. Now, this is for a 32-bit address. Uh, I'd use 32-bit address because they're smaller. It's easier to deal with. 64-bit uh, address is same idea, just everything gets larger, and the number of bits is more. Same concept, though. This is the simplest form of cache, direct memory cache. Yeah, this one you see on the screen has got 2048 lines of, of cache information. Each line contains 32 bytes of data. And here's, um, so here they are. There's uh, 2048 numbered 0 through 2047 lines. Each line has a valid bit to tell us whether the information on the line is, is up to date and valid. Not shown here would be another bit or collection of bits that would tell us whether or not the data had been modified. If, for example, we need to load a new line from a different location in memory, we would need to know if the current line had been altered. If the data in the current line has been altered, we want to write it back to mem main memory. 
If it hasn't been altered, well, we can just load new data directly in. This would be the case where the tag was different uh, on a memory reference, but the line was the same. So for example, if we had line seven, um, but a different tag, we would want to know whether the data on line seven had been modified. If the data has been modified, it needs to be written out before new data is read in. It contains a tag, which in this case is 16 bits. It doesn't have to be, but in this case it is 16 bits. And we have 256 bits, eight words, or 32 bytes of data. The amount of data, again, is a design situation. You can make it larger or smaller. 32 is a good number. Uh, all right, so these are this is the tag. Now, in the in the in the data areas you see marked out here, there are the words. Those are the eight words that are in here, and they're marked as such, and they're numbered zero, one, two, three, four, up through seven. Okay, the in a in a direct map cache, the CPU is going to present the cache system with an address. Here is an address. All right, the um, and we've colored it to indicate different parts. The cache system, this particular cache system will pull off the tag, the first 16 bits. It'll pull out the line, which is the next 11 bits, and it will um, take note of the word and byte. The byte is the byte in word. So if I pick word number one, as you see here, um, the byte would be, this would be the, zero, the zeroth byte of word number one. That could be zero, one, two, or three. It would indicate which byte of the word. And most of the time we're only, we fetch a, a full word, but you could fetch in an individual byte. All right, so that's that's what the layout is. Notice the 11 bits here in the line. There's 11 bits to the line. Well, 2 to the 11th is 2048, 2047, excuse me, 0 through 2047. So the 11 bits here can count you, can take you into the a particular line. It's an index into the cache. Um, if we look at it a little, are these numbers fixed in stone? No, they're not. Uh, you could change them. For example, if I had a 15-bit tag and a 12-bit line, so I made the tag slightly smaller and I made the line bigger, that would mean we'd have we could have 4096 um, lines. The previous one, uh, by the way, was um, 32 32 bytes times 2048 is 64 KB. 64 K uh, of data was in that cache. Well, if we shift it around a bit and make the tag 15 bits and the line 12 bit, that means we've got 4096 lines, which we double the number of lines, you're going to double the number amount of data, assuming we're still 32 bytes of data per line. If I went to a 14 bit tag and a 13 bit line, that would be 8192 lines or 256K of data. 13 bit tag, 14 bit line, that's 16384 lines or half a meg of data. And finally, a 12-bit tag and a 15-bit line would get, would yield 32,768 lines and one meg of data in the overall cache. So where you pick these boundaries, there's a lot of reasons because they obviously this takes up more space and so forth. But um, it's a judgment call on the designer's part. All right, how does the cache work? Well, as we said, the when an address is presented by the CPU to the cache system, it breaks it down into the appropriate parts. First thing it wants is the line. That line tells it where to go, which of the lines in the cache it wants. Now I was numbering these in decimal except for this one, the seventh line. Uh, it's actually the eighth line, but the line with the number seven on it. I used a small number here. So if the line is zero, um, all these zeros, leading zeros, followed by one, 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 it will take you to this line in the cache. Next thing, once we've picked the line, is we compare the tag that is stored in the line with the tag on the address that the CPU is presented to uh, with. <clears throat> if they match, and if the valid bit is one, we have to check if the valid bit is, is one, then we have it. We have found the line in the cache, um, and we can then proceed to pulling out the data. So we look at the word here, that say it's a word fetch, and we get word number one from the data field. That's how it works. Now, backing up here, the question is, uh, could there be other tags? Of course there could. There, the 16-bit tags, in this case here, there are uh, 64K possible tags. And for each of those possible tags, there's 2048 possible lines. So yes, there could be lots of different tags, 64,000 different, uh, 64K 
not thousand, sixty five thousand five thirty six to be exact, um, tags that could appear here because they would refer to different parts of memory. The line might be the same on two tags. So I could have a tag here, this one, and another tag, let's say, that began with a one. And they could both have the same line. It would both take us to the same position, but the match wouldn't occur. Uh, if, this, if, it, if, this was the, if this were the address in the, in the line, the tag portion of the address in the line, and this was the, the tag of the actual word we're looking for, and it had a one here, they wouldn't match. So it means we didn't find it in the cache. If we don't find it in the cache, then uh, the system will go out to main memory and bring it in. Now the direct memory mapped cache is the simplest to implement. It's very straightforward, uh, relatively quick, but it has limitations. There are certainly some things you can't do with it. And we'll look at some more complicated caching algorithms uh, in another video. I have one slide here of the AMD bulldozer architecture, uh, which is fairly complicated. But you can see the different parts. There's a, a level one instruction cache, and we say got four of them all together, instruction decoder. Um, the interesting, this is rated as a eight core machine, but it's not really. And it's got, uh, it's really got four full scale cores, but it does have multiple integer units in it. There's, um, I don't know where the floating point, the floating point here, you can see there's four floating point. But for each, um, for each unit, there's two integer processors and one floating point. So it gives you some place you know, in the general vicinity of, of, of higher power, especially if you're doing integer work, you get the effects of um, what looks like almost uh, four, uh, eight processors. However, you still only have one, you know, the instruction decoders, there's still only four of them and so forth. It does have a shared level uh, two caches, and it has, it has what it calls a shared level three cache. How they coordinate these caches, I'm not sure of. But you can see the uh, somewhat extensive diagram with caches all over the place. Anyway, next time we'll try to look at some of the more complicated caching algorithms.